Okay, I want to welcome you all today to the Potter's Roundtable. Topic for today is building your own gas-fired Raku kiln. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. And basically, if, if you, I don't know how familiar everyone is with Raku, but really the only requirement for Raku is some way to melt the glaze. Um, it could be a wood-fired kiln, it could be a gas-fired kiln, it could be an electric kiln. Really, all you need is some way to melt the glaze on the pots. Um, but in addition, one of, the, one of the sort of additional requirements is you need to be able to open the kiln while it's hot and remove the hot pots. And so you, it, somehow, whatever, what, however you end up firing them, you have to have access to the kiln. We can talk, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more later. I personally, and I've known people, for instance, that use an electric kiln to raku fire. They'll heat the pots in the, in the electric kiln, melt the glaze, take them out, and then they do the post-firing reduction in the cans or in the combustibles. But my, personally, I've got some things that I don't like about electric, electric kilns that I'll mention later. So I thought in this case, for this talk today, we'll focus basically on, on gas-fired kilns. So we're going to, I'm going to talk about three small, three different possible designs. There are probably a lot more designs, but three possible designs for small and, and portable or more or less portable gas kilns. Three types of construction. One is, and I'll just go down them and then we'll talk about them individually. First one is just a fiber lined metal trash can. And I was discussing with Martha earlier, you can make a very nice small Raku kiln out of taking a garbage can and lining it with ceramic fiber. Works great. So we'll talk about that. Second one would be a metal, a metal barrel which serves as a cover on a brick base. So in the first case that I mentioned with the, with the trash can, the trash can sits upright. In the second case, you have a metal barrel that you, you put upside down and that sits on a brick base and the burner mounts into the brick base and so the metal barrel is kind of just the cover for it. And we'll talk about that. And the third one is basically a repurposed electric kiln, which you've probably all seen or heard of that. You take an electric kiln body and convert it into a little gas kiln, and that worked great. They, all of these work really well. And some of them have advantages for one reason or another over another, depending on the, you know, the particular design. So the first one, the fiber-lined metal trash can. Basically, um, you will just, you'll just take a metal trash can, and I've, I've, used these, I've built these in the past, and I'll take like a 30-gallon uh, metal trash can, and I line it with ceramic fiber, on the inside, so I take a roll, line around, and I line the lid. And in case you haven't seen it, here's a sample. I'll pass this around. This is this is a one one brand. This is one inch thick kaolin blanket. This this one inch thick blanket is equivalent to an insulating brick. This is incredibly efficient, and it's and it's really lightweight. So if you and you know you're welcome to feel it if you want, but it, that's that's sort of standard one inch thick insulating blanket. It's very easy to work with. You can cut it with metal like metal tin snips, metal shears. Easy to work with. Um, so basically, I'll line, the, I'll line the, the, the kiln with the blanket and line the lid with the blanket. I cut a hole in the lid. I'm gonna, I'll talk a little bit, but I basically cut a hole in the lid. I cut a hole in the side for the burner to go in, and then you end up with a setup that looks something like this, with the shelf propped up, the burner comes in under the, under the, the, the shelf, and that's your kiln. I typically, what I found for a, th th and th you know, when these are all, basically all these kilns are essentially updraft kilns, which means that the flame is coming in at the bottom and the flame is exiting the kiln at the top. Okay, that's an updraft. So in this case, this, the burner is coming in on the side and it's exiting the top. The hole in the top I, I found for this size about five inches is good. There's no fixed rule, but the, 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 the main thing, the guideline, the main point for cutting the hole in the top or, or having a hole in the top of the kiln is you want it to be big enough so that you can look down in the kiln and see all the pots. Because frankly, I, from my experience, cones are worthless for raku kilns. Because you don't, you're not really firing by the cones. What you really need to do is you need to look inside and see whether all the glazes have in fact completely melted and are mature. Okay. One of the things I'll mention later on, but this is an important point with Raku, depending on whether, and it varies whether you're using commercial Raku glazes or you're making up your own recipes, not all Raku glazes mature at the same temperature and over the same period of time. 
Some of them are slower to mature, some of them take a higher temperature, some of them mature early, some of them are runny, they vary a lot. So you really need to be looking at the glazes. And one of the things that sometimes people run into is, if you mix too many different kind of glazes in the same firing that you haven't fired before, there's a good chance that some of them are gonna be underfired and some of them are gonna be overfired. So it really helps if, when you get into raku firing is learn, do some tests, learn your glazes and find out which ones are compatible for the same firing. I have some glazes that are really nice, but I can't fire them with some of the other glazes that I have because they take a lot longer or higher temperature to mature. So by the, by the time they're mature, the other ones are overfired and they're running off the pots. So in spite, it's, it's kind of like the same thing with cone six glazes. Not all cone six glazes are in fact cone six. Some are cone five, some are cone seven, and they require different conditions. So it's the same kind of situation, is it? It helps to, it helps to really you know, test your glazes. That's why I say, but so the, it's really important for Raku, from, from my perspective, to be able to see the pots. I want, I want the hole big enough that I can look down in, move around a little bit, and see how the, the melting is progressing. On the other hand, I don't want the hole too big because then I'm losing a lot of heat, and then it's just a really inefficient way to, to fire the kiln. So there's a balance here. So there's nothing sacred about five inches. I've just found that that's a, that's a useful, that's big enough that I can see and not so big that it's gonna waste a lot of heat. Um, the, on, in this kind of a design, you could, generally what I've done when I've done this is I, I, put, I put fiber blanket down the walls and I also put fiber blanket on the bottom of the kiln. And then, but, and because the blanket is kind of soft, when I wanna put the kiln, the posts to support the shelf, I don't want them just resting on the blanket. So what I've done is I put an extra shelf resting on the blanket on the bottom, then put the posts on that, then the second shelf. So that the, at the bottom of the kiln, I've got a shelf, I've got three posts, and I've got another shelf which is actually resting on the blanket. So this gives stability to the shelf. Because otherwise if the posts are standing on the blanket, they can be kind of wobbly, okay? And so, and then I, and I, and I, and as far as cutting the holes, what I found an easy way to do it is you don't need anything fancy, just an electric drill and you drill, you know, mark a hole on the metal, drill a whole bunch of holes close together, and then you can just with a pair of tin snips, you can just connect them. It's really, and now you don't end up with the most beautiful looking hole, but you can bend the little pieces inside and it works just fine. So it doesn't have to be anything particularly sophisticated. The bottom hole really depends on the size of the burner. And this, and this is something else I'll mention now, I'm gonna mention it again later, but Raku, unlike, you know, normally if you're firing with a gas, with a gas kiln, you're, a lot of times at least you're interested in reduction. In Raku, you don't want reduction in the kiln. Because a big part of the effect that you get with the Raku glazes and the iridescence is due to the variation in the reduction that you get when you put it in the combustibles. If you get heavy reduction in the, in the kiln, all your glazes, will, they'll, they'll basically, a lot of them are based on copper, they'll go like to a dull red color with no variation whatsoever. So you really don't want, rec you don't want reduction in the kiln as much as possible. So it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it helps to have the hole for the burner a little oversized. You don't want a snug fit with a burner. You want, I, I mean, an, even an inch, or at least a half an inch, or, or even an inch oversized isn't, isn't bad at all because you want air going in. You're not trying to get reduction. You just, you're, what you're really trying to do is burn the gas as efficiently as you can, which means enough air to burn it. You know, with a, well, a lot of times with a gas kiln, you purposely cut back on the air so that you get reduction. In this case, we don't want to do that. We want to burn the gas as efficiently as we can because all we're trying to do in this case is get heat out of it. We're not trying for reduction. We're just trying to get, to get the most heat out of it to heat the pots and melt the glazes. And, I've, and as far as holding the blanket in place, I've found, there are a couple of different ways you can do it. One of the ways that you can do is you can take pieces of wire and I'll talk about the wire in a minute, and bend them into a shape that looks like this. Looks sort of, and so I, I start out with them straight, like this. I make something that looks sort of like a hairpin. I drill a hole in the metal, push this through, this is, this is on the outside, and then I bend the prongs over on the inside like a hairpin to hold it. And you just use high, and you use high temperature wire, I'll pass this around, which you can buy. The other alternative, which works even better, is Make some buttons. I made these just out of, out of raku clay or just any kind of coarse stoneware. And basically then I make a little U-shaped thing. I push it through here and through the blanket, drill a hole and bend the, bend, bend the prongs on the outside to hold it. So I have, a, I have my little button and I have a loop of wire that comes through, through the button, comes through, goes back the other side. And when it, after it goes through the wall, I just bend these out or twist them together to hold the button. The button holds the, holds the blanket in place. 
But if you don't have the buttons, even just the wire like this, if you bend it through and then spread the prongs, that's enough to hold the blanket because it's not going anywhere. And it'll almost stand there by itself, but just to keep, you know, to keep it against the walls. So, and I'll pass this around, but you can buy this. It's just high temp, they call it high temperature wire. It's the same kind of wire, for instance, that if you've ever done, if you ever want to fire beads, you put bead, you string beads on the wire to put them in the kiln to fire them. The other alternative, which I found works really great, is if you've ever installed elements, in, new elements in a kiln, or if you ever have them installed, there's a part of the, the element called the pigtail, which is the straight end of the element. And this is the same, this is great, this is the element wire. This is great to save. So if you ever have somebody, if you install a new element and you cut, you always cut these off because they're always longer than you have to be, but this is the part that pokes through the, the, the kiln wall and then you cut off the extra. This was the extra I cut off from one element. This is great, this is high temperature wire. So save these and you can use that to make these, these hairpins and these clips. This is great, it's, it's flexible, it's easily bent, and it's, and, it's, and it's extremely high temperature because this is actually element wire. So anyway, if, I'll pass this around if you haven't. But this is called the pigtail because all, when you buy an element, it comes with these straight sections and then there's the coil part and then there's another straight section. And those two, you know, you'd lay the loop around inside the kiln and then poke the two pigtails through the wall and connect it to the power supply. And you always end up cutting several inches or more of these pigtails off. And it's great wire to save. The other thing, I guess, that one of the things I should mention here is that you may have seen designs for Raku kilns where it's similar to this. There's some kind of a metal framework lined with blanket. And you've seen it where it's, it's made out of the metal mesh, like expanded metal mesh and screening. Personally, I don't think that works nearly as well because if, I don't, you probably didn't try this, but you can actually blow through this because it's so, this is light. And so to me, the, the solid metal wall holds the heat a lot better than the metal mesh. I mean, cause, and if it's a windy day, the wind can literally blow through this stuff and carry your heat away. So personally, I like the idea of the solid metal wall. It maybe is a little more difficult to work with than, than making it out of screening. I've seen where you can just take like hardware cloth and line it with it. And it works. It's not nearly as, as gas efficient. And the pots also, they cool off faster. One of, the, one, of the, the, one of the reasons, and there, you know, you've also, there are two sort of main designs that you may have seen for Raku kilns. One of them is this, where basically there's a bucket or a kiln that you're reaching down into to remove the pots. And there's another design, sometimes called a top hat, where basically the, the top comes up and exposes the pots. I prefer, personally, I prefer this kind of a lot better because it keeps the pots hot. The minute you lift up that lid on a, on a top hat kiln, all the pots are exposed, and so if you have a number of pots in there, unless you have a lot of help, while you're going one pot, all the pots are cooling off. Whereas when you're reaching down into the kiln, it tends to keep the pots that, that you haven't removed yet, keeps them hotter. So you, which, and if they're hotter, you're gonna get better reduction when you move them to the, when you move them to the reduction <coughs> part, okay? So that's, that's just personal, but I found, when I, from what I've seen in the past, is that, I mean, it's really easy to take screening and bend it into a cylinder and cut a piece to put it on the top, but I don't think it holds the heat as well. Um, even when you're firing, I think it's less efficient. You're using more gas. Um, and I've, 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 I've fired a kiln like this all day on a barbecue tank. Oh, and I, well, the other thing I should mention also is that, you know, and once you, when, you, when you have your, oh, let me, let me talk about, I'll introduce the burner now because we'll talk about them later, but this is, I'll, I'll, I'll pass this awkward thing around. This is a simple, this is, this is a setup that I have for a Raku burner, and we'll talk about burners a little bit. This is a, this is a Raku burner, and all I have, as you can see, it's a pretty simple setup, is I have a shutoff valve right here, and I have a regulator, and this, this screws into the barbecue tank, and that's all you need. So this, this fitting here, this is the, the same fitting that you have on a, that takes, except screws into a barbecue tank. So this is, this is a regulator that basically, I can control the pressure because you can't use the pressure straight out of a barbecue tank. It's too high. It would, it would waste a lot of gas and it wouldn't work really well anyway. But you want to control it. So this is the regulator. I typically, and this is adjustable. I can, I can turn this screw and I can, I can change the pressure that's actually coming to the burner. I typically might fire this thing at like two, pound, two PSI. That's two pounds per square inch, three pounds per square inch. You don't need a lot. Okay, so the, the burner, the burner, the setup for the burner basically consists of the cast iron burner on the end of a hose with a small, with a shutoff valve right behind the burner. That's the one basically that allows me to control the burner, turn on and on and off the gas. And then at the other end of the hose, and this happens to be about a 12 foot hose. And then at the other end of the, the hose, 
there's an adjustable regulator which adjusts the pressure um, coming out of the tank. Okay, and this is it. This is all you need. These come, you can, I was looking online recently. You can get a kit like this, depending on the source, the ceramic shop has them, I think for like $175 in round numbers. Axner sells them. A lot of people sell basically a setup just like this. But this is all you need, this and the, and the tank, and, that's, and you're in business. Because the, the other thing is, you know, even from a practical point of view, you, don't, you never want a, um, a, a flame too close to the source of the propane, because if you have, if you were to have, if you didn't, for instance, tighten the fitting on the propane tank enough and you had a leak, you could, you could, you could, the flame could jump back to the tank and blow up the tank. So you, you want to separate the tank um, well, you know, safe distance from wherever the flame is. By the way, does everybody know that propane has that distinctive smell? They, they purposely add something to the propane. It's a sulfur compound, and they add, a, they add a, a sulfur compound to it so that you can smell it, so that if there's a leak, you'll smell it right away. You'll, you'll smell the propane. But yeah, you want to separate them. And typically what I do, like when we fire it out here, I put the tank sort of around the corner of something next to it so that there's no chance that I'm going to get any kind of, you know, that even if the wind were blowing and I had a leak, it's not going to blow over. But yeah, these, this, a setup like this is pretty, I looked around, they're pretty commonly available online. You know, a lot of different, different places sell them. And the burner, that burner is typically, that's about a 50,000 to 75,000 BTU burner. Burners are rated by, by the, the number, BTU is British Thermal Unit. That's the unit of heat that they can produce. And burners are tip, gas burners are typically rated in terms of BTUs per hour. How many BTUs of heat can they put out in an hour? And that depends a little bit on the pressure and you know, the setup, but that's roughly a 50, I think that's a 50 or 75,000 BTU per hour burner, which is, at burners go, that's a small burner. That's a small burner, because you can get burners that go up to a half, a half a million or a million BTUs per hour. And it's nice because it's a really simple burner, it's just one piece. And it puts out a really nice steady flame, and you don't need a lot of pressure. And as I say, I've operated it all day long on, a, on one barbecue tank, if you, you know, if you operate it efficiently. So you, need, you also need some way to support with this kind of, some way to support the burner. And what I found was an easy way to do it was I made a block I took a, a piece of, ever, ever familiar with soft, what's called insulating fire brick or soft brick? So I you can work it, I wanted to show you that you can work this with woodworking. This is how I shape my bricks. Okay? So, so you, can, you can work, the great thing about insulating fire brick is that you can work it with old woodworking tools, old drill, you know, if you have an old auger bit, or you have an old, this is my, this is my old saw that I use for cutting bricks. And so you can, and if you have an old file or an old rasp, you, so you can shape it, it's great. So I made, a, I made a support block like this out of a half a brick, and I'd rest the, the burner in it like that, and I could prop this up to hold, because I also wanted stable. I didn't want this thing flopping to the side and rolling around and setting my car tires on fire or something if I walked away. So I could prop this up next to the kiln and use that to hold it, you know, to, to uh, align up with the hole in the, in the garbage can. So I, I recommend you know make some kind of a stand or some kind of a support out of bricks to hold the to hold the burner in place, and you will need that to go along with the garbage can, with the trash can. One, oh, just a couple other little details I had here. Yeah, I would say, basically, you know, in this case, with the flame is coming in under the under the shelf, you want at least an inch gap, at least an inch between the edge of the shelf and the blanket. So if you're building one of these things. And you're trying, you know, and you, you, let's say you're going to put a circular shelf or shelves in there. You want at least an inch of space between the edge of the shelf and the and, the, and where it where it hits the wall, because the flame has to come up from underneath the shelf, come up around the outside. So I'd say at least an inch on the outside when you if you you know if you're purchasing a, a couple of round you know a round shelf to use, because the flame you don't want to choke it off down here. You want you want at least plenty of space for the flame to come up around the outside of the shelf between the, the edge of the shelf and the blanket. And the other thing you may find you may have to do with this, and this, with the garbage can, I didn't have to, but with some other kinds, you may have to, this just because of the design. You may want to put a brick, partially cover up the top of the hole, because th this will, you know, you're losing a lot of heat. You get this big hole in the top and the flame's going up and out. So the longer you can keep the flame in the kiln, the more efficient, the more heat you're going to get out of it. So what I found sometimes is you might want to put a, a piece of brick like this over and partially cover the hole, not so much that you create reduction, but enough that you just retain the heat. And you can play with that a little bit. I did that the last time we had the, the Raku firing here. If I choke it down too much, 
I'm doing the same thing as I would on any kind of a normal gas kiln. That's like the damper, and I'm creating reduction by choking it down. I don't want to do that, but I, but I want to try to block a little bit of the heat from escaping quite so fast. So I'll put a brick over the top and, and slide it back and forth a little bit. And you can tell if the inside of the kiln starts to get kind of hazy, if the atmosphere gets hazy, you're probably getting reduction. If you get a strong yellow flame that's blowing up out of the kiln, you're probably getting reduction. And you definitely don't want to choke it off where you start to see the flame backing out of the hole where the burner is. If you block the exit too much, you're blasting gas in there. It has to go somewhere. If I block the exit hole too much, it'll actually sort of back out by the burner. And you definitely don't want to do that. You don't want to block it so you get so much back pressure where it starts coming out where the burner is. The other thing you might want to do is that what, with the, if you look down from the top of the kiln and the burner is only coming in from one side, the, bur the flame is going to tend to travel across the bottom of the kiln and come up the opposite side from the burner. And what you'd really like is the flame to spread around the whole periphery of the shelf. So what I found sometimes is useful is take small pieces of, again, insulating brick or something and make and put some little obstacles, like if here's the burner coming in on one side, put some little obstacles underneath there that will deflect the flame so that it, also, it doesn't go shooting straight across. Some of it will kick out to the sides and tend to spread the flame around so that it comes, around the sh it comes up around the shelf more evenly, not just on the opposite side. Because other si otherwise, you're going to have one hot side of the kiln and, and a cold. The side where the burner comes in will actually be the cold side of the kiln because the flame will be blasting across the bottom, hitting the wall and coming up on that side. So if you can make a little obstacle course under there with a couple of pieces of brick, they don't have to be soft brick, that can be hard brick but something, and, and deflect the flame a little bit so that it sort of spreads it. That, that also helps give you more even heating. The other thing about this kind of a kiln is you really can only have one level of pots. There's no way, to, there's no way, to, there's no way you could have a shelf easily and get down in there and lift the shelf off and get to a second level. So whatever size this kiln is, you want to you, you know, make, it, make it, plan it so that, like I, when, I made, when I made the first one of these, I knew what size pieces I wanted to make. So in that case, that determined the height, basically, of my post. I wanted to be able to reach down in there comfortably, get the pots without having to, you know, without having to strain too much or, or at, at an awkward angle. I wanted to be able to just reach in and grab a pot and take it out. So that, that sort of controlled where that platform was going to be, what the, what the, what the right height was for the, for the shelf. I wanted it to be convenient. Okay? But you, can all, you really only can have one level of, of posts, of, of, of shelves in this, in this kind of a kiln. One other thing I'd recommend, and this and this is I, this is for all Raku kilns, is that you know your shelves tip. You can use the normal sort of you know those light sort of tan cordierite shelves that you can buy that the inexpensive fairly in, those work fine, but you don't want to fire your pots right on those shelves for a couple of reasons. One, it's fairly common for Raku glazes to run. They're, they are. They're, they're low temperature glazes. If they're even slightly overfired or they're applied thick, they're going to run and dribble over your shelf. So, excuse me, you'll end up gluing your pots to your shelf. And the second thing is, one of the big, one of the big causes of failures in Raku firing is, you know, like, you do a firing, you know, you, basically, at some point, you're loading pots into the, by the second firing, you're loading pots into a hot kiln, right? You do a firing, you, the, the glazes melt, you turn off the kiln, you take the pots out, and now, right away, and before the kiln gets too cold, you start loading, you put in the next load of pots, right? So that you've got, unless you preheat the pots, and even that doesn't matter that much, you're putting, you're putting cold, more or less cold pots into a hot kiln. So one thing I found that really helps break, that's when a lot of the breakage happens. You stack a, you stack a cold pot on a hot shelf, is you put a layer of, of again, cut from this material, of, of insulating fire brick on top of the shelf. So I'll, cut, I'll make like a mosaic, I'll, I'll cut the, and it could be old, they could be, they don't have to be perfectly nice pieces. I'll, about a half an inch thick, I'll cut slices of insulating fire brick, and I'll put a layer of those slices on top of the regular shelf. And that does two things. That will, that makes a disposable shelf cover that I can throw away if I get a lot of glaze runs. And these, when, when, you, when you turn off the kiln, this insulating fire brick cools off really quickly. So when I put the next layer of pots in, it, I'm not putting, I'm not putting a cold pot on a hot shelf. I'm putting it on a warm shelf, but not a really, really blazing hot shelf. So it really cuts down on the breakage on the pots. A lot of the ways that Raku pots break is you stick them on a hot shelf and the bottom cracks because you stick it on that hot, and it simply, you know, the shock is tremendous. 
So I found this really helps a lot. And you can, again, you can take the saw and just cut slices of a brick like this and I make and sort of tile the surface of your shelf with the insulating fire brick. It catches drips. If, you get a, if the drips get bad enough, you throw them away. If your pot gets glued to them, it's easy to grind off your pot. And it also prevents the shock of your pots when you load them into the kiln. It really, it, it, it's dramatic how much it will reduce cracking and, and, of the, and destruction of the pots by having, not having that hot shelf. It really helps a lot. We hope you're enjoying the show. Please take a moment to leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps new listeners find the show. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates as new episodes are released. And if you'd like to support the video and podcast production of the Potter's Roundtable, become a patron. Go to patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Your support will help us achieve our goal of creating a digital library spanning the ceramic arts for use by educators and artists alike. Thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. As they say in the game, the great thing is, you know, I, I just, this is an, a saw that I had for years and it finally just got too dull for use for carpentry work. So now it's, it's, it works great for, uh, for uh, you know, for cutting insulating fire brick. We hope you're enjoying the show. Please take a moment to leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps new listeners find the show. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates as new episodes are released. And if you'd like to support the video and podcast production of the Potter's Roundtable, become a patron. Go to patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Your support will help us achieve our goal of creating a digital library spanning the ceramic arts for use by educators and artists alike. Thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. Okay, the second type, the second type of kiln that I design that I wanted to talk about. There are a lot of others, but these are ones that I think I think are easy to make. This is where the metal barrel with some kind of a metal barrel that's upside down on a brick base. So they're not quite as portable as the first kind. Matter of fact, I was talking, Martha and I were talking before we started the meeting, and I was saying, you can also, I've made one of these kilns out of, you know, they're a small sort of, they used to call them ash cans almost, like metal garbage cans that are only about this tall. And they make, that makes a really nice, makes a really nice raku kiln. You, can, you can't fire a lot of pieces in it. And you, don't, you, know, you only end up with about this much height at the top, you know, nine inches or so. But the nice thing is it even has a bale handle on it that you don't have to take off. So you can just you can literally pick it up and, and, and move. You don't even need two hands to move the kiln. You just pick up the thing and move it. They make, they make really nice little raku kilns. Just those, those, I don't know what size that is, 20 gallons or something? I'm not sure. But it's about that tall. And they, work, they work great. So anyway, this kind, basically, the difference with this is I'm going to take some kind of a metal barrel and I'm going to turn it upside down and I'm going to put it on a brick base. And this, this, this opening that I've shown here, this, is, this ducks under, this goes under the edge of the, the that's, that's, my, that's from my burner. Now the advantage of this, and, and so what I've done is I've taken, this can be a metal garbage can again. This can be, um, we have, I'll, I'll, I'll show you, I can pass around some pictures later that I've got. We have one of these that we used over at Hood for years, and um, it was made out of a half a 55 gallon drum. It's a nice size. Uh, so basically, I've got, I've got some kind of a metal barrel or, or a half a 55 gallon drum, um, and I line it with fiber again. Now in this case, I also, I need to add some kind of handles onto it. So I could add, when I'm, when I'm constructing it, I can add like, what I've done sometimes is, you know you can buy in the hardware store, you can buy what's called threaded rod. And it's basically metal rod, typically, let's say, quarter inch thick. And it's, it's threaded all the way. You can cut it with a hacksaw and bend it. And then you can put screws, in, you can put nuts on the end of it to attach it. So you can make your own U-bolts out of it also. Or you can buy, you can buy ready-made U-bolts if you want to. But so you might want to put either loops. You could put loops on the top, two loops like that that you could pass a bar through to lift, because th in this case, you're gonna need probably two people to remove the lid, okay? So you could put loops on the top, and you'd slide a metal rod through it, and people could pick it up and just move the lid aside. Or you could put you know, loops on the side that you could grab with your hands, 
and gloves and pick it up and move it aside. But you're going to need to add some kind of a handle onto the upside down bottom of this drum to be able to move it. Now, the, the, one of the advantages of this design is now you can stack shelves. So I can put a, I can put a post in you know, a shelf and I can put posts and I can put shelves and stack them. The disadvantage from my perspective is that when you lift that lid off, all the pots are exposed at the same time and they're all cooling off. So if you have a lot of little pots on there and it's just you or one other, well, or one other person, you've got to be pretty quick in terms of unloading because there's nothing to hold in the heat. Okay. But on the other hand, the other thing that's nice about this is this is a very, this is the fact that you can stack them. It's very flexible as far as sizes or even irregular shapes. Like if you have sculptures or something that are hard to grab, you know, like the other, the other kind of kiln, I have to grab it from the top, basically. Well, some, there might be some pieces that are really awkward to grab from the top. You might have to grab them sort of around the waist or at some particular, if, especially if it's sculpture, you might have to grab it in some particular place. This gives you a lot more freedom in terms of how do you actually grab the piece to remove it from the kiln because you can get at it from the side as well as the top. Basically, the burner, you, basically you build a, 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 a pile of bricks and with an, with a, an in, where the burner can, and that's what this is a picture of, this, this picture in your handout here. This first picture is an illustration of just a simple base and the, the, the part where the, the burn, and so in this case, the burner is still coming in from the side underneath the shelf. And the nice thing about this is if you assemble it from these insulating fire bricks, you can build this any size you want. Okay, so this, the, the, as this illustration is showing there's like a, there's a brick missing and that's where the burner would come in from the side and then come up and hit the bottom of the shelf. So I can make this pedestal, this platform, any height I want, any, any size I want to fit any, any barrel that I have. In this case, I really recommend making at least, the, if, if you, let's say you wanted to make it tall, fairly tall so you don't have to bend over so much, at least the top layer or two should be out of insulating bricks. Because again, you want to hold the heat. And also sometimes even the, if you just use normal, you can use actually even normal red house bricks for the bottom of the pedestal, but I'd say at least the top one or two layers should be out of insulating brick, because again, they're going to hold the heat. So, and then the next, the next um, one that I have here is a little fancier one, the next illustration I have, and this is just a, a, the same principle, but I this is the base that we used over at Hood College for the Raku kiln over there, and this was designed to fit a 55 gallon drum. And in this case, what, we, what, if, what I did on this particular plan here, what it shows is I have a concrete block base. This was just to raise it up. I didn't need it, but we just wanted to raise it up to make it more comfortable to use so you're not bending over. So we put a, a layer, or you could put multiple layers of concrete blocks and then put some layers of brick and finally insulating brick to raise it up to a comfortable height. The only thing you'll need with this is you still need some way to support the burner. You so in this case, as you noticed on the illustration, there's a little bit of a ledge sticking out where the concrete blocks are larger than the, than the other bricks. So you still need some way to prop up the burner and hold the burner opposite that opening in the brick. But as I say, the great th thing about this is you can, you can lay these bricks out to fit any size can. So it's not like they're, and, you know, and if absolutely necessary, at Hood, when we had this one at Hood College, we'd cover it over with a tarp. But if it's a small one, like this first illustration I'll show, you can just take it apart every time, put the bricks in a box and take them inside. You know, this was, you know, a dozen bricks or something like that. And put them in a box and, and take it inside. You need to take five minutes to reassemble it. So it's really simple and it's nice because it is, it is really flexible in size. You can make any size base if you happen to come up with some weird size. Or let's, you know, there, sometimes there are, there are people that make sculpture pieces. I know there are people that make like very, a lot of flat sort of slab work and they're actually making wall pieces. So, they're doing, so they can make a really big flat. Have you ever seen these old wash tubs? Well, they made, they made one of these out of one of the wash tubs, which is, you know, like, what, I don't know, what are they, 30 inches wide or 28 inches wide? Because they were firing slabs. So they could, again, they could make, just could make a really wide brick base um, and then fire a slab in it. And they didn't need the height. All they needed, they were firing one slab at a time. So they could do really big, relatively big slabs, um, just lying, supported flat, um, and then have the wash tub upside down over it. Okay, and then the last, the last sort of design I wanted to talk about was basically reusing an old electric kiln body. And this is a really, this is what we've done outside here. This is a really easy thing to do, especially since electric, there are a lot of dead kilns around, and you may have one yourself that you've been wondering what to do with. This is a, this is a really easy thing to do. 
Um, first thing I'd recommend is re if you have an old electric kiln, a dead one, is remove the elements and all the controls and things from the end. Get, get rid of all the electrical stuff um, from the not, It won't hurt anything, but there's no point in having it there. You don't need it. It's, it's kind of in the way. So I would do the same thing for a, for a normal size electric kiln. I cut a, I cut a five inch hole in the, in the kiln lid. And again, the, and so the, the, you can cut the hole. Again, what I did was I took an, an, I had an old quarter inch drill bit that was a little too dull to use for woodworking anymore. And so I just drilled a bunch of holes in a circle. And then I used an old saw, like, you know, like they have, they can, you can buy these drywall saws or it's called a keyhole saw, pointy one. And I just connected the holes. Any, any woodworking tools can be used for, for cutting this insulating brick. You don't want to go back to woodworking if you do, because this will, this will dull them significantly. But if you have them, like, you know, if you have, usually if you do woodworking, you have old drill bits that aren't quite sharp anymore. You may have some old wood chisels. Those are all great for using on insulating fire brick, because they're more than sharp enough or, or hard enough to cut this stuff. So you can just drill a bunch of holes in the top, um, and, and connect it with a saw, and then you can take a file and smooth out the hole, and you end up, you know, with a nice, nice hole cut in the top of the bricks. Um, and so, and you, and then the other thing, you, then the other thing you're going to want to do is, so you cut a hole in the lid, and then you're going to want to cut a hole again. And there are two possible. I'll talk about. There are two possible burner arrangements that are easy to do for an old electric kiln. One could be the same thing we've we've seen before, where you cut a hole in the side of the kiln, or um, you could hold, you could cut holes in the bottom. Now, in the last page in the handout that I gave you here, this was something, actually Dennis discovered these, I think. It was a company called Summit Kilns, and they made these pre-made pre burner stands. It was like a square metal frame or rectangular welded angle iron frame with the burners built into the frame. And I think we've both sort of found out recently that they don't make them anymore. Unfortunately, we have a couple of these that Dennis brought over to the studio. They're great because it's basically all you need is a hose to connect them to the to the burner, to the, I mean to the tank. Um, there may be I brought this along only because maybe there's some I didn't do an exhaustive search. Maybe there's somebody else out there that makes them, or maybe this. But th this was a great alternative. And in this case, the one I've shown you in the illustration, there you can probably see there are two burners. So in this case, and you could buy these in different sizes to fit the size of the electric kiln body. So you basically, you just cut two holes in the bottom of the electric kiln that, that lined up with the burners and set the kiln on top of it, and you had a, you had a, a gas-fired kiln. But if, if these are not available um, any longer, if, you know, if nobody else has picked it up on it, um, you can still do it where you cut the hole in the side. And I, now in this case, most electric kilns have the metal shell around it, right? So you need to cut the hole in the metal as well as cut the hole in the, in the brick. And I did it the same way when I've done it on mine. I drill a bunch of holes in, in the metal and connect the holes, and then I cut through the brick. And it's really not, it's not that, you know, you don't need any special tools to do it, okay? So anyway, so the, the burner arrangement, basically, um, if you don't have, if, if, if those, if that's the ones with the pre-made stand are no longer available, you can still do the same thing with cutting, cutting the hole in the bottom um, and putting the burner and coming in the side. The one thing I would, and now if, if, the, if you're, this is one thing that, I, when I'm making an electric kiln, I actually like to remove the lid. I don't like to use the hinge anymore on a, on a, on a gas kiln, on an electric kiln. Because if you think about it, I like to actually remove the lid and take it off. Because if you're, when you're opening the kiln and you flip the lid up, you know, and then normally it will hang on the chain or there's some kind of a support. If you're working with a raccoon kiln, that hot face of the, of the lid is facing you. And if you are, especially, you know, like sometimes Raku is a social event and you have a bunch of people that are all helping and everything, it's a really easy way to get burned because you're going up and trying to reach in. And meanwhile, this two foot plate is radiating heat in your face. So I actually recommend if you're going to do this, take the lid off and make it a separate lid that you have to, you know, you have to put handles on. For the one out here, I can show you if you, if you want to after we go. I made these out of threaded rod. So I, I put in the side, in the side of the lid to the kiln, this is our lid. I put in um, two, two J hooks like that on either side. And then you walk up to this with this sort of loop of metal, put it in here, and two people lift it off and put the lid, put the lid down. And, and I also, and also I re, what I recommend is have some place safe to put the lid that's out of the way. Because again, because Raku it tends to be a social thing, you don't want somebody walking into a hot lid. And as you know, also, if you've done raku, there's a certain amount of excitement and people are running around grabbing hot pots and, you know, so you want it to, to make it safe. 
So one of the things we found that worked great is we have an old kiln stand you know, from an extra kiln. So when we take the lid off, we set it on the kiln stand so it's hot side down, and we purposely put it to the side so that it's out of the way so nobody is likely to run into it. But this, again, these were easy. This is just plastic pipe, plastic tubing that I got. This is, this is a piece of bent threaded rod, and I made the handles out of slipping plastic tubing over it, and the nuts, because it's threaded, the nuts thread right onto the rod. So I just put washers, to, this is just plastic tubing that I put as sort of insulating handles on it, so we can use this to lift the lids off. And you might want to, again, a nice thing with the electric kiln, you might want to, you know, set it up on some blocks. It doesn't have to be down on the ground, so you can set it up on, because it's got, it has the bottom to the kiln, you can set it up on concrete blocks to get it up to a comfortable, you know, working height. Uh, the other thing that's nice about this electric kiln is, you know, a lot of times one of the things that goes bad on electric kilns, or if you happen to inherit one, is the bottom cracks, you know, the, the, usually the bottom on an electric kiln goes bad before the top. And so you don't even need the bottom because you can always build a platform out of bricks the same way we did for the, cash, the trash can and just use the, and set the body on that. So this, I've, in the past, when I, was, when, I was up at, when I had my studio in Maine, I had a number of people that gave me kilns that they didn't want because they had cracked the bottom and the bottom was basically falling out, which I didn't care. I just took the whole bottom off and, and made my own brick platform. So that, that's another. So you can really use, as long as the sides are intact, and you have some kind of a lid, you're in good shape. And if necessary, you know, you can even make a, a garbage can lid top for the raccoon kiln. You can get a garbage can lid and put some blanket on the inside, as long as you have the, but the cylinder is nice because you've already got this nice insulating, insulating, of, you know, fiber, insulating brick cylinder for the body of the kiln. Okay, let me see if there's, oh, oh, and so I guess, one of the things, this I wanted to mention a little bit, so just when I mentioned earlier about using electric kilns, of course, if you're actually doing raku, even though we're talking about gas kilns, I'll mention this, if you're, doing, if you're actually using an electric kiln to fire the pots, of course, you absolutely want to turn the power off when you're removing the pots. Um, and one of the problems that I found with electric kilns is because, that I just alluded to, is because the lid hinges up. So even though the lid is supported, when you, lift, you've got a, the, you turn the kiln off, it's still really hot. You raise the lid up. You have to have some kind of a tool to raise the lid up because you can't just grab it by the handle now because right there the, the lid is hot. So you need some kind of a long hook or something to raise, to raise the lid up. And it's kind of hazardous because that, that exposed, that whole face of the, the lid is hot. And then you're facing that when you're going down into the kiln. So to me, it's kind of dangerous. It's kind of dangerous. Um, and the other thing, incidentally, also, is the fact that, aside from being dangerous to you, the, it change, the temperature in the electric kiln is changing suddenly, and ultimately, that's not good for the elements. The elements are cooling off really fast, and that temperature shock isn't good for the life of the elements either. So I don't, I personally, and this is just my own personal feelings, I don't recommend using an electric kiln for those reasons, because I think it can just be really dangerous. So I just I had a couple of sort of general uh, like firing tips that I want just for about Raku in general that I wanted to mention because they sort of relate to some of the things we've talked about. One of them is, as you probably know, generally for Raku you apply the glazes thicker than you do for other kinds of firings. Because a lot of the times, especially with some of these, um, these glazes that depend on copper, you can actually cook the copper right out of the glaze. And so in order to get some of the good, good, and you also don't want the glaze to cool off too fast, so you generally want to apply the glazes thicker than you normally would. And in some cases, if, if, you, if, you, if you do raku and you know, you're not getting really what you think is good color response, look at the glazes because there's a good chance they're too thin. Okay, so you want to, you want to make it a little thicker. On the other hand, a little thicker means they might stand a greater chance of running if they're over-fired, but, but you'll, get, you'll probably get better color response. And the other thing, the other point, another point I mentioned, which I did already, was that different Raku glazes can mature at very different temperatures and times, depending on what it is. So if you're in a, I've, I've seen this in school situations or community studio situations where you have a whole bunch of glazes and you just put a whole bunch of pots in together. If, you're, if you have it all possible, either test your glazes and find out what glazes mature under the same conditions or if you know what they do, how they, they behave, separate them when you do the firings. So that you can, so that you don't have, in one firing, you don't have some glazes that are underfired, some glazes that are fine, and some glazes that are overfired. So if you can't, that, and that's something to watch for, because again, 
the, the, because of the range of recipes, they can be very different in the way they respond to the temperature in terms of melting. There's, I've had some, I had a really nice glaze that was sort of a satin, opaque white mat, but it took forever, just because of the nature of the glaze, to actually melt fully. Meanwhile, if I had it in with other glaze, the other glazes are melting and running off the pots. And it took a while for me to realize that also, that I had to say, okay, I can't fire that glaze with anything, anything else. That has to be by itself so that I can give it enough time to mature. And you can't, as I was saying, when I started to say, you can't force the firing too fast. If you, if you try to, if, you know, you get impatient, you say, well, I'm gonna, you know, last time the firing took a half an hour, I'm gonna get it down to 20 minutes. If you turn up the gas too much, you will get reduction. You'll get a lot of reduction because you're simply forcing the gas into, into the kiln too fast for it to burn efficiently. And so you're creating reducing conditions. And you'll see that. If you, if you try to rush the firing too much and you turn up the gas pressure or the, or the valve too much, when the pots come out, you'll see they're already starting to look redu the, reduced in color and you haven't even put them into the reduction cans. And then you won't get the nice colors because you're not getting any of the variation. You've thoroughly and uniformly re reduced them and they won't come back. So you don't get a lot. And also you, what you tend to lose is the iridescence. You know, a lot of the thing we like about Raku, one of the reasons why the Raku glazes are iridescent is because they're only getting reduced at a, as a thin layer on the top of the glaze. It's the same principle as oil on a, water, on a, on a puddle of water. You know how you, the oil and you get that iridescent film? It's because that thin layer of oil bends the light, ref, reflects the light, and that's what creates that iridescent, and those iridescent colors. That's the same effect that you're getting for a lot of the colors in Raku. And if you reduce the glaze all the way through, you lose all that iridescence. You may get the copper red color, but you lose all the iridescence. Okay. Um, if you happen to have a law, if you're using an old electric kiln body, I had, a, I had a big electric kiln body that I made into a Raku kiln. It was one of these ones that's like 30 inches across, and it was nice and deep. But, and so in a way, it was kind of a waste because I still, had, I still could only use one shelf. And so I had to have the shelf pretty close to the top. So two thirds of the kiln was being heated and I couldn't use it for anything. So there's some advantage, some, in that case, if I'm, for that kind of style where I'm using an old electric kiln body, for me, there was some reason to go to a smaller kiln because I had to heat up that whole kiln and yet all I could use was the top foot where I could, in order to be able to reach the pots. And I mentioned already about putting slices of insulating fire brick on the shelves, that works great. That will really cut down the breakage Especially, you know, like a lot of pots, and depend, again, if you're in a studio, especially maybe where you have some beginners that tend to make pots that are thick on the bottom, that's, that's just asking for trouble when you take a thick bottom pot and stick it on a really, really hot shelf. You're going you're gonna to crack the bottom of the pot. That's where a lot of the cracks happen. So I found by putting the fire bricks, I cut them at least a half an inch thick, the slices. That really helps a lot when I'm loading, doing the successive loadings, when I'm putting pots into what's now still a hot kiln is by having those fire bricks covering the shelf. It really cuts down on breakage. Um, I already mentioned already that where you have a horizontal burner coming in under a shelf, put some extra pieces of brick under the shelf to deflect the flame. And what I, what I did when I was setting up one of my first kiln was, um, I put the burner in the side of the kiln and I took the shelf off and I looked at it. I turned on the flame and I put the bricks in there and I turned, light the flame and watch and see what the flame did. And see how, and if not, I turned it off, move them around a little bit until I could, and, and just look down on them. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I had no eyebrows, but a perfect, a perfect <laughs> setup for the flame, you know? But yeah, but it, that's easy to do, you know, because it's a small burner, and you can, you, can, you can just see where the flame is going and move the bricks around until you get, an, you know, what looks like a pretty good arrangement so that you're spreading the flame around. Um, I mentioned already about using a damper brick over the top of the kiln. Um, the only thing that that will save a little bit, that'll save some fuel and it'll speed it up a little bit. It won't, it, you don't want to, you don't want to choke it off too much with the damper brick. So this is a matter of experience. You need to find out how much can I cover the hole so that I won't get reduction. I don't want to create a lot of back pressure in the kiln, but I'm slowing down some of the escape of the heat just so I'm not wasting as much heat. It isn't absolutely necessary, but it will speed up the firing a little bit just because you're not wasting as much heat. That's all. Um, and, as I, and again, along with that, I mentioned you don't want reduction, and so don't try to fire the kiln too fast. If you push it too fast, you, can t you only need a couple of PSI to operate these burners. And eat, ev actually, every single size and design of gas burner has an optimum pressure, a range of pressures that it's most efficient at. 
And above that, below that range, it's not efficient. And above that range, you're just wasting gas. It doesn't, it, you, you can't just, it's not like, you know, we can just keep turning it up and turning it up and get, and get more and more heat out of it. At some point, it stops, it stops, you can't burn all the gas that's coming out of it and you're just blowing gas out and wasting gas. Okay? The, other, the, the last thing I wanted to mention was just that when you're raccoon firing, it's a good idea to have an extra metal trash can around to dump the, the, the smoldering remains of the previous reduction. So you know you 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 unload the you have your you have your metal containers set up, and whether you know and there are different ways of doing that. You know some people put the put the materials in the metal container. Another way to do it is you set up a bed of sand. This is a good way. Matter of fact, if you live in a residential area and you're worried about smoke, I found you 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 put a layer of sand on the ground and you don't have a bottom. You put the pot on the you put the pile of combustibles on the sand. You put the pot on you put the lid upside down over it and the sand acts like a seal. And, air, and no smoke gets out of it virtually at all. But either way, so then when you're finished, but especially if, you, if you're putting it into a metal bar, barrel, okay, now the, you've let them cool for 10 minutes or so, you take your pots out, and now you have the smoldering remains of the wood chips or whatever, what do you do with it? It's a good idea, have an extra 20 gallon, 30 gallon metal garbage can with a lid, you can dump all that stuff into it and spray it with a little bit of water or just sm sm you know, choke it off with a lid and then you can load the bucket separately. Because otherwise you have this, you, you don't want to use the stuff that's already in there, you don't want to add to it. It's much better to just dump it out, start over, reload the reduction containers with some fresh paper or fresh wood chips or whatever you're using, and then you have all you've, and then you can collect all this stuff in that other barrel. And it's worth, so I found it's worth it. Just have an extra metal garbage can around to dump all those containers into. Okay, thank you all for coming today, appreciate it, and I hope this was useful. We know that this was a lot of information in a short period of time, so if you want to hear it again, listen to our podcast version of the presentation. Search for the Potter's Roundtable on your favorite podcast platform. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.